Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Welcome, Christina. Thanks, Jandra. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone for sticking with us. It will be our 10th episode. Before we begin and get into Christina's story and a little bit about her, I want to remind everyone to share this podcast if you found it helpful and feel that you know others who also might find this information helpful to subscribe and share this either through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on I Care Better's YouTube channel. Today, we are going back and having another patient story, patient experience, which these stories are meant to be shared with others that might feel quite alone in this disease, as we know it's hard to navigate, and many have very similar stories. I am very excited to introduce Christina and give a little bit about her background. Christina is an endometriosis patient and budding endo and chronic illness advocate. Christina is taking a much-needed break right now from climbing the corporate ladder as a clinical research professional to work on getting healthy, pain-free, and finding herself again. When she's able to return to her career of over 20 years, Christina hopes to be able to utilize her vast and varied research experience, which includes oncology, pediatrics, neurologic, hepatic, and infectious disease, and shift her focus to women's health, specifically the intersection of endometriosis, rare diseases, and pediatrics. Christina is excited that through her advocacy work and by delivering successful research for new therapeutics from inception through new drug approval, with the assistance of the teams she manages, she will be able to contribute to the well-being of others who are experiencing what can be an isolating and overwhelming diagnosis. Thank you, Christina, for coming on and sharing your story. You are a researcher. It's not specific to endometriosis. Can you share a little bit about your background? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm really happy to be here, Jandra. Thanks for having me. Um, I felt a little bit like an imposter um, listening to the episodes because I thought, okay, you know, Anna has um, a vast background in therapeutics. And even though I have a background in research, I felt like maybe as just a patient, I didn't have as much to offer um, for the podcast. Um, and it actually took me quite a while to summarize my bio. Um, I mean, we were supposed to meet a few weeks ago for this interview and um, had to reschedule. And I remember seeing the um, the form and it says, you know, give us your background, your social media. And I froze. I just, I looked at it and I was like, I don't, I don't even know how to begin to answer this because I, I don't know who I am anymore. And that's part of why I included that I'm trying to figure out who I am again. Um, because so much of my life, the last 20 years and more intensely, the last 10 has been I am a researcher. This is, and I am what I do. And now that I'm on a forced break, I have the opportunity to figure it out again. And I know that for sure, if I would have been healthy enough to go back to work immediately after my hysterectomy, like we were all expecting to, I wouldn't have this opportunity. Yeah. yeah we've talked a lot about that together and it's really hard to take that break and not be so busy in the ways that you're normally used to being so busy. Yeah, exactly. It was really nice to have a little bit of extra space so that I could figure out how to summarize that. And I really feel that that's my goal for myself is to help women um, and other people who I uh, were born female and are experiencing these issues, especially in discussing your story with you. There is a huge lack of just even acknowledgement that this can happen and start at a really young age for, for some kids. Absolutely. I think starting at the beginning, you have a very extensive journey, not just with endometriosis, but other complex diseases that many others with endo suffer from as well, which very much changes the course of care, prognosis, understanding of what is what. 
can you tell us a little bit about kind of teenage years, when everything started? Just to give a quick background summary, my mom, when she was pregnant with me, had some some issues um, with bleeding. She was put on bed rest. And when I was born, I was very small. I was about a five pound baby, which for a full term pregnancy with the only issue being some bleeding. And I think somewhere in her second trimester was a little surprising that I would be that size. I don't think anyone really thought anything of it. I was healthy generally otherwise, but throughout my childhood, I did have a lot of various childhood illnesses that you would expect from children, you know, ear infections, lots of um, sore throats that were, you know, sometimes strep throat, sometimes not, but much more frequently than my peers did. It, it was just addressed on an as needed basis as you did back in, you know, 1980. 485 through the early 90s because yeah. I am solidly in the exennial category um, with my birth year. No one ever really looked into why that might be happening more frequently for me, which was okay. Like many others, we often find out about the histories of our, our families, our moms, aunts later on in life and starting to put the pieces together. Yeah, and that's something that sort of come together a little bit more for me recently, especially with conversations that I've had with my mom, even within the last month. So around, you know, middle school, I started having a little bit more frequent issues with that. And it was getting to the point where I was actually missing such a significant amount of school that they looked at allergy testing. I think I had my first MRI when I was 13 um, because I was having significant sinus issues, which they couldn't figure out why. Been through a gamut of tests and sure enough, I had an entire, entirely blocked sinus on this side that would not go away. So I had my first surgery ever at 14. I had my tonsils removed, and I had something called a FES surgery, which is yeah. What is that? Can you explain? I don't that remember a what more? the acronym stands for, but what it does is they basically uh, put a scope up your uh, up your nose into your sinus, uh, drain everything that's in there, pack it with uh, gauze uh, that's soaked in medication, and then you have to have this gauze packed in there for I believe it's at least a week, maybe a few days. And at the same time, they uh, removed my tonsils and my adenoids. Had a terrible reaction to the anesthetic. Woke up right as my best friend was walking in to visit me from the hospital. You know, we're 14 year olds. And uh, I started violently vomiting uh, blood because of all the blood that you swallowed during a tonsillectomy. So horrifying for me, horrifying for her. (laughs) And I think pretty bad for both of our moms as well. Yeah, I'm sure. I had my tonsils out when I was 19. It was horrendous. And I can't even imagine vomiting right after that happened, let alone, I feel like I couldn't even drink water for a week. I did, but it was hard. I can't even imagine vomiting. Yeah. One of the interesting things about my childhood illnesses specifically, especially with the ear infections, the doctor would look in my ear and it would be flaming red, covered in infection. And he actually showed my mom and he said, for some reason, Christina is like pretty silent. Like you can tell that she's in distress. She's pulling at her ear a little bit, especially when I was a baby. Most kids that I see with this level of infection are screaming at the top of their lungs. And that for some reason, was not something that I was doing. So you can see from the very beginning, my pain system has either not functioned properly, or I've been in so much pain that I disconnected from my body entirely, which we know now has been my experience the last few years. Absolutely. You've said to me on many occasions, both things, maybe my pain tolerance is high, maybe I don't have pain tolerance, but I think as a kid, when you haven't integrated what that means. The signs are screaming, crying, fussy. I do think that that speaks volumes to your entire system as a whole versus your perception and 
lived experiences and how you handle pain as we do when we're older and have that cognition. Yeah. But I think it's actually been a detriment to me, um, especially as I got older and as I received more diagnoses of various things, especially with the endodiagnosis, because I wasn't in or wasn't complaining about the amount of pain that I was in. No one really took me seriously or tried to help me until until I saw you. Well, I'm glad you got the help that you needed in the in the right direction. And we will come back to that because your story of undergoing a diagnosis and even before you got to me is very important for people to hear. During that time, even before 14, when you were eight, nine years old, when breast buds were starting to develop and that estrogen is rising, in addition to the infections, what was going on around that time, eight, nine years old, those years before you started your period? I didn't really seem to have any sort of GI issues, but I was also a, a dancer and an athlete. So I was in pain from, you know, working my muscles all the time. And I was one of those kids that I very much appreciate the variety of activities that my parents gave me the opportunity to try and to stick with, but I was doing something or to something every day of the week. Like I didn't really have a break when I was 12 and got my period for the first time. It was actually the very first summer that I told my parents that I needed a break from, you know, doing ballet five days a week. And they allowed it, which I very much appreciate, but it was, it was difficult to go back to. When you started your period, did you have the typical experience of pain, heavy bleeding, missing school and work, well, not work, but missing school, missing dance? What was your experience, I guess, symptom-wise around that time? And how did it impact your activities? Oddly, I was, I was 12 and a half. I remember exactly when it happened. It was, I believe, the July 3rd. And I'd graduated from sixth grade about two weeks beforehand. And the one That's thing impressive. that sticks out, I know, I have a, a very specific memory for some things. And recently, that changed quite a lot, which is very frustrating for me. I remember being at a party at my friend's house to celebrate graduation. Like literally every kid in my class was there. And we got really excited because the song came on and everybody was jumping up and down and yelling. And I did that too. And um, I had a little bit of urine loss from my bladder. Mm. And I thought, what? this is really strange. And I kind of freaked out. I went into the bathroom. I was horribly embarrassed because, oh my gosh, what if somebody saw that? But of course there was really no way that anyone could have seen anything. It was just me that could feel it. And then two weeks later, I got my period. I didn't make that connection until probably a few months ago that there might be something some sort Tied of connection there, but I don't know. Did you ever have incontinence during ballet? I, I've seen some dancers at young ages that do just because of the the load of activity, but it's usually a pretty consistent thing throughout their teenage years, not sort of a one-off and not necessarily tied to their cycle. Yeah. I mean, it definitely continued into my t later teenage years, um, especially with activities where you have impact uh, jumping anything like that, um, especially if you're not actively engaging your pelvic floor muscles. Or they're over-engaged and stuck in this sort of hypertonic state and not able to give you the proper support that you need. Which I think is what we found when we initially started working together was yeah. that was the case for me. When you started your period, did you have a lot of, of pain initially or did that come later? No. I did not have any pain. I had what I felt like was a normal cycle. You know, I had a little bit of cramping, but it wasn't like some of my friends who were, I had a couple of friends who were unable to get out of bed, really had really bad cramping. And I just was curious about it because I thought, huh, that's interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. I just have a higher pain tolerance. Maybe my periods aren't as bad as theirs. And it was just a, an interesting observation that I filed in the back of my head and sort of let go of. 
do you feel that your periods were still, you know, relatively normal? Or do you feel like that was a contextual thing because of the pain, con- uh, because of the high pain tolerance potentially? No, I mean, I really think that my periods were normal. Yeah. I'd never, I never had heavy bleeding. I never had as a teenager or in my early 20s, horrible cramping. Everything just seemed normal. What kind of happened next in your journey as you went through your teen years into your 20s? Well, at the, around the same time, starting in middle school, I started having issues with uh, depression. I also kind of came out of the womb as an anxious human. It just translated into some depression issues. So as things continued, and I still continued to have issues, especially with the sinuses. When I was in my junior year in high school, um, they had checked me multiple times for mono. Didn't have it, didn't have it, didn't have it. And then the last, very last time that they checked and the doctor, I remember saying to my mom something like, well, we can check her, but she probably doesn't have it. She's never had it every time we've checked her. Sure enough, I have it. I think I missed the vast majority of the fall of my junior year, um, which is Mm -hmm. a critical year for when you're in high school especially if you're looking to go to a four-year university. So my grades were terrible. I felt awful. And I never really fully recovered after that. I remember going into my senior year and, you know, feeling pretty good and healthy, but very much so had some memory issues. Before, I used to know every single person that I Went, that I was in school with, especially in my class, was familiar with a lot of the kids in the younger classes. And I stopped remembering who people's names, who they were, even if I knew them before. I thought that it was because I had grown up to the point where I didn't need to remember everyone's names because I was going to be leaving the next year. But now looking back, I realized that was probably some brain fog that was happening. And some totally. memory issues caused by the mono that I had. Crazy the thing that our brain tries to piece together to make sense of. Yeah. But I mean, from all empirical data pointed to the fact that I was recovered from the mono. I was also told that I would never, ever get mono again, that you get it once and you're done and then you're healthy. But During my senior year or towards the tail end of my junior year, I had to have a, uh, another surgery on my sinus because it had reblocked. And this time he went in and he actually made the passageway a little bit larger so that it was able to drain on its own. And even to this day, it still does that. If I have my head in a particular, uh, position laying down. Did they ever go further into why you were having all of these issues? No, I think that they were always just looking at the immediate issue and what the problem is or what the way to solve that issue was. Right. Not the why. Why does this keep happening? Just we know how to treat this. Exactly. And that happened. The same thing happened when I was in my mid 20s. When I was 22, I got a very strange rash on my leg. I went to the doctor about it. He looked at me and he said, that's just an infected spider bite. Like put some cream on it, put a bandaid on it, go home. I later learned that that particular physician was well known for being dismissive of young women in particular and not treating them. I learned that through a very close friend who was also a physician who worked in not the same group, but a similar group uh, within the same network. I went to see an allergist. I went to see, I think, two different dermatologists. And by this time, the water-filled bubbles had spread to encompass about 30% of my right leg, and they had jumped to my left leg um, and spread in a similar pattern down my left leg. They were painful. I had had biopsies done on them, and nobody could figure out what was going on. That's crazy. Did they ever figure out what those rashes were? Um, No, they eventually went away. I think they gave me a number of different prescriptions, probably, and 
forgive me, this is more than 20 years ago. They probably um, gave me some sort of steroid uh, to address it because it was incredibly painful, very itchy. And I knew enough not to itch it. And about two years later, I had detached retinas in both of my eyes. Around that same time, I had also had a significant loss in my life. My father had passed Mm -hmm. away from Alzheimer's um, and I'm going to try not to cry. (laughs) My father passed away at the end of December and at the beginning of March. And I remember this distinctly because it was uh, when I went to my best friend's house to watch the Oscars and it was happened to be her birthday that they were on. So I know the exact date. And obviously I know the date that my dad passed away. Can't forget that. (laughs) I, Mention, I remember going to my doctor and mentioning, hey, um, on this date, I passed a huge clump of some sort of tissue uh, when I started my period. And the clump is about fist sized. And he looked at me and uh, just said, are you, well, is it possible that you were pregnant? And I said, I mean, no, I mean, nothing has changed since the last time I saw you a year ago. I am still celibate. Like it, it's been about two years since I've had any sexual interaction. So definitely wasn't pregnant. And he just said, well, it happens sometimes. Thank you for sharing that story and about your dad. And that is really tough. As you were saying this, we've talked a little bit too about, you know, mass cell disorders and various things in your history suggestive of Number one, chronic infections, inflammation, but the rashes, the detached retina, and you haven't mentioned this yet, but the hypermobility. And all I was thinking about these symptoms that you were sharing was this is like a mast cell, you know, syndrome or mast cell driven issue more than likely. And of course, stress really significantly increases that threshold where a body might react to certain things or or triggers. Yeah, since since a young age that was happening in your early to mid 20s, along with the anxiety from when you were younger into depression, there was already gaslighting happening from a number of providers already about things not even necessarily related to endo. But what was your support system like from friends, family? Well, one thing that I would like to say, and I think that I should have said this at the very start, I have to acknowledge that I have a ton of privilege. I have lots of support from my family and friends. I have a lot of resources and education and access to those things, as well as financial help when needed from my family, as well as my husband's family. I think saying that really is helpful, maybe to acknowledge people that don't, because that's one of the things that I've seen in my work life, where there is definitely a huge you towards people with economic stability and access to appropriate health care. And even for me, it was difficult to get the care that I needed with all of the privileges that I have. Thank you for saying that. That's a really important point. And same for me too. As much as it was difficult for me to navigate, I as well have had a lot of that. And so many other people do not have that. Thus, our reason for advocating for others with this, because it's not fair. It's not, and it's not right, and our systems are set up to actively not help people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mid-20s, gaslighting, already having a number of systems impacted. What happens next? Um, I think one of the important things to mention is with my dad's illness, I also was experiencing some of what I experienced when my endometriosis symptoms got really significant. And that particular one was I was having trouble breathing. I couldn't expand my diaphragm the way that I was supposed to. And there was always a catch at the top of my diaphragm. After my dad passed and I got through the intense portion of morning, I was able to breathe a little bit easier. Still didn't feel quite normal, but it didn't have the catch and it didn't have the intensity of contraction that I had to actively push through with my brain as well as my body. When I started having those same symptoms, again, when my endometriosis was getting really bad, I chalked them up to 
stress and anxiety because of the intense nature of my work. And with your dad, the stress of a chronic illness or a terminal illness and him passing away too, I'm sure friends, family, even usually well-meaning, including doctors, that would be that number one. Well, it's just anxiety. Mm -hmm. The gaslighting at that point had been so ingrained in me from hearing it for so many years that it didn't even, no one need to say, needed to say anything to me. Yeah. I was already saying it to myself. And even though I've done a ton of work to not do that to myself, this week especially has been a little bit rough. Mm -hmm. And I've started to hear that voice crop up in my head again. And I have to remind myself and the voice that this is the trauma that you've experienced mm -hmm. and not actually the truth or the truth as it as it is to you. And that's really what's important. It's hard to change your own narrative that you create from such a young age, but it can be changed. What I want to highlight what you said there too is although it pops up, you've discovered tools, whether it's with help of other professionals or just yourself, to stop that thought process from occurring and change that narrative, even though that might be your baseline to some degree. Yeah. As you know, I've been in therapy for very solidly for most of the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. I have a number of different therapists who have helped me since then, who have been just fantastic. And I can't say enough about each one of them. And I can think of all of them specifically. <laughs> so next chapter in Christina's journey. So about 10 years after that, I mean, I was fine throughout my 20s. I did normal things like you would expect a mid to early 30s person to be doing who was uh, working and traveling for work. There was a certain point where I stopped being able to wear heels. And I thought, okay, this is, I've been wearing heels since I was 14. I was one of those teenage girls who wore heels to high school. <laughs> And I had really bad issues with uh, my skin. And I went to a number of different doctors, dermatologists, uh, functional medicine doctors, because I started having other weird symptoms too. Joint pain, things like that, that were just sort of not tracking with uh, someone in their early to mid thirties. And my mom, who has uh, a form of arthritis called psoriatic arthritis, um, as well as just regular standard, you know, arthritis that I cannot remember the name of. Yeah, just osteoarthritis. Osteo, thank you. Oh my gosh, brain fog. <laughs> she found a really great rheumatologist who also um, was a functional medicine specialist and uh, was an immunologist as well. And she kind of described me and um, my skin issues, which were, I had pretty bad cystic acne. Um, mm -hmm. I luckily don't have scarring from it, but it was bad and all here, like on the lower half of my face. And she said, I made you an appointment with uh, Dr. Schickman for your skin. And I looked at her, I was like, why are you making me, first of all, why are you making me an, any appointment? You know that I travel for work, like I may or may not be here. And secondly, I was a little offended because I'd been trying really hard and nothing I was doing was working. And what is this immunologist, rheumatologist going to do for my skin? Like this doesn't make any sense at all. So as soon as he saw me, he was, I think the first physician to actually look at me. He obviously did a physical exam and see me and think there is something not correct here. He's like, I don't know what it is, but. I have the tools and the background and the ability to figure it out and to help you. And if I don't, then I can find someone who can. Yay, Dr. Schickman. I know. As much as he is not a warm and fuzzy teddy bear of a physician, he is a brilliant clinician. And if you can deal with not being held and supported and just being given facts and an actual help, then you can't find a better doctor than him. So I have heard when I first moved to San Diego, actually, I learned about Dr. Schickman from a doctor that I work with who's in Mission Viejo, who's into more functional medicine as well. Um, he also is an endosurgeon, and he's the one who actually told me about Dr. Schickman. I've since had several patients similar to you have seen him in the past. 
and stick with him? He saw me, he did some testing. He obviously, he ultrasounded all of my joints and said, well, you have arthritis, but I can't tell if it's uh, just from the ultrasound, if it's psoriatic or if it is something else. Testing came back and sure enough, Unlike my mother, I do not have the gene for psoriatic arthritis, but I did have a very high uh, viral load from uh, Mm Epstein-Barr, and it was an active viral load at that time, as well as an infection of something called Bartonellosis. Yeah, tell us more about that. Bartonellosis is one of the over 300 plus uh, infections that can be transmitted by a vector. So what does that mean? Bartonella infection is very similar and acts similarly to Lyme disease. Everyone is familiar, I think, mostly with Lyme disease and knows that you can get it from a tick. You get a tick bite. Uh, Sometimes you, if you get a uh, bullseye uh, reaction on your skin, you 100% have been infected with a tick that has Lyme disease. So the standard treatment is uh, 28 days of doxycycline for that um, if you catch it early enough. But I think recently they've actually changed the guideline on that. And I think the CDC is recommending a week maximum, which is not sufficient. I didn't know that actually. Most of the patients that I've had that have had Lyme disease have been treated either multiple rounds or a 28-day round or multiple antibiotics at the same time. Mm -hmm. I've never seen just a week. I think that's the new recommendation. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a lot of complexity, especially with Lyme disease, because the CDC standard for Lyme disease to be diagnosed is that you have to have five of the bands that they test for as a positive. And if you don't have five, even if you show a prior infection on any of those bands, it's dismissed as not being active and not being an issue, which if you have someone that is coming to you clinically, like me as a patient. Obviously, I did not have Lyme disease, but I had a Bartonella infection. And I know what that came from. It was that rash that I had on my leg. I did have a bite. It just didn't react the same way. I know where I got it. I got it at Batiquitos Lagoon when I was hiking. Yeah, this infected spider bite. Mm -hmm. What's even more interesting is my matron of honor years later was hiking at Batiquitos and got a classic rash. And she was treated for 28 days with the doxy and has been fine since then. But it was caught really early. She knew immediately what it was. That's Mm -hmm. not always the case. I mean, some people, as you said, can be treated for 28 days and then they need to be treated multiple rounds. It just all depends on how your system is set up to handle infections. Exactly. Yeah. Genetics. What's what else is going on? Yeah. So many factors. So he started treating me for the EBV infection um, and called, told me that I had something called reactive arthritis, which is mm. basically a, an arthritic reaction to some sort of viral issue, previous infection, something like that. So we chalked it up to being the Epstein-Barr virus, being active currently at that point, but also had been my initial infection when I was 16. He treated me for a while. I wasn't getting significantly better. We tried a few different things to see what would work. And then after my after I got married, which was in September of 2017, I went back to him to see about a specific issue. Like I was seeing him regularly as probably more than anyone should see any medical provider, but I was not well. I mentioned to him uh, like in October, November timeframe that my hair was falling out and I couldn't figure out why. That triggered something in him where he said, okay, let's, I need to do this additional testing. And that's when he discovered the Bartonellosis. Mm. So we started the treatment for that. And the treatment for that was a little scary because it was uh, injections twice monthly on either side of my hip. And I had to go in every single time to do the injections because of the location that they had to be. I couldn't have asked my husband to be trained. It needed to be done by someone who was well-qualified to do injections. Mm -hmm. And they were painful because the type of penicillin they were using was very viscous and is intended to sit under your skin and in the muscle for two weeks until you go to the next one. But they also had to rotate locations because I would be getting these lumps where those were and they were quite painful. Interestingly, after I started getting those injections, my skin cleared up. Wow. Yes. Going in for cystic acne to the immunologist 
integrative rheumatologist getting injections and, you know, skin clears up. Interesting. Yeah. Which I wasn't expecting at all. I had resigned myself to have crappy skin for the rest of my life. And now my skin is as clear as a bell. Which makes sense though, because although yes, there are situations where you can in your 30s get cystic acne or different acne spells, typically hormones have sort of settled and you're not really getting acne. And most people will say, oh, just wait till you're in your 30s. You're not gonna have to deal with that. People told me that it was actually relatively true. So that is interesting that you're in your 30s and having this happen. What was even more interesting was that I had clear skin throughout my entire teenagehood until I was about 22, 23, 24. So it didn't start until I started having issues after the vector bite that I had. And I'm not convinced. I don't know for sure that it was a tick, but a vector can be anything. Uh, I don't recall seeing a tick on me. I don't remember. I mean, they can be tiny, like smaller than the size of a pin. Little babies and still give it, give you a vector infection. <sighs> oh, yeah, I know. I <laughs> hate bugs. I am terrified of bugs. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't remember when it started, but I, I've had aller various allergies to multiple things. And I think that started when I was a teenager for sure and has definitely increased over the last few years to the point where I can use, you know, something that just happened a few months ago. I put a particular brand of makeup on my face, had a little bit of a reaction, and then about 10 days later, put another round of that same makeup on my face and my entire face blew up. Yeah. Same thing with any kind of like a, a bug bite, like a mosquito bite, immediate, just welt all over me. Yeah, that's not fun. I'm one of those people as well. Mm -hmm. My whole body starts itching after like one tiny little bite everywhere head to toe. They love me. Yeah. I mean, thankfully, somehow I married someone that doesn't have a, a reaction like that, but they love him more. So <laughs> sorry, Ron. <laughs> yeah, probably better off. <laughs> so you know, I'm in my mid thirties. I had literally just started dating who is now my husband. And I start dealing with all these like kind of weird medical issues, you know, but this time he's married to me. So he's stuck with me. <laughs> We've navigated through together and I couldn't ask for a better partner. He is my partner and my best friend. He's the first person that I felt that I've felt like I can be completely myself with. I really appreciate that about him, especially because it has not been easy, especially as we got to the point where we were ready to start trying to have a baby. I just got a little teary. Knowing and working with you as many other patients, I feel like I sort of get to know their partners and you always pick out those really great ones. I mean, I think you got the opportunity to meet him last fall when he had to drive me to an appointment because I literally was in too much pain to drive, much less walk up the stairs by myself to get here. Actually, yes. Now I recall. I feel like I just know him from working with you. Well, probably not the him that he would want you to know. The next chapter in Christina's journey is trying to have a family. So we um, were blessed with uh, Ron's previous marriage, um, blessed us with a beautiful little girl who is now almost 13. And she is just the best child. And I love her so much. We have a really good relationship with her, uh, her mom. We live about 15 minutes from one another. It's really nice that I get to feel like I can parent her, mm -hmm. see her mom when she's with us. Because although her mom is wonderful, you know, she needs a mom person when she's at our house too. Yeah. So that fills my soul. But I wanted, Ron and I both wanted to have a baby that was, you know, ours. Half mine genetics, half his genetics. One of the things that my gynecologist at the time had me do was an ultrasound to make sure that everything was okay. And then an MRI because there were some things that were concerning on the ultrasound. We had done ultrasounds previously because there was some concern, especially with the cystic acne that I had PCOS, which I did not. So there was no explanation there for the acne. So when we went back to look at the ultrasound again, and there was a, an endometrioma on my left ovary. I also, my lab work showed a elevated, but not super elevated, uh, CA-125. Oh. Yes. Which, uh, do you want to explain what that might indicate? It's interesting because in a lot of the research in endo, they'll mention that as a marker that might indicate endometriosis. It's a cancer marker ultimately, but can be found in some with endometriosis. I have had only a handful of patients have that marker come up. We know now that 
a mine was elevated then and continued to be elevated as my endometriosis got worse up until, you know, my, I had my surgery in December. That would have been right after I turned 40. So 2019 when that happened. So he was concerned about the uh, elevated CA-125. There was an obvious endometrioma on my left ovary that was visible upon ultrasound. And he was concerned that it might affect my fertility because there was also, in addition to those two things, there was also a fibroid that I had growing on my uterus. The location of the fibroid, I was told, should not affect my uterus's ability to carry a pregnancy to term. And at that point, it was still small enough that it shouldn't have been an issue. Regardless, because he was careful, he sent me to MRI. Uh, they confirmed, yes, endometrioma. No one ever explained to me. I didn't look further into it because I trusted what my doctors were telling me. No one ever explained to me that an endometrioma is a definitive proof that you have endometriosis. Yeah, it's ovarian endo. For everyone listening, that is one of the three types of endometriosis. Endometriomas is ovarian endo. You have superficial disease and you have deep infiltrating endo. And this is 2019? 2019. Jesus. With a very well-established practice that I know multiple friends and family have seen various providers within that practice. And a physician who I had at that point been seeing for at least 15 years. And it's 2019. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. I'm trying to pull something up here, if it's okay with you, because this is ahead. a video podcast. When we get to the appropriate point, I want to pull up what your insides look like, because this was only a few years after 2019 that you had your surgery. Three yeah. years. Three years there after. Was there was, there was a lot, uh, and it was like June of 2019 as well. So like halfway into the year. Yeah. So, okay. So it was picked up on the MRI, really wasn't told any more information about what this was, that it was really recognized as endometriosis, but you were having fertility issues. So what was, what were their next steps for you? We hadn't started for having fertility issues. This was just in preparation for me trying to start getting pregnant because- Got it. Thank you for that clarification. I had been on years of birth control. And uh, when I turned 35, because there is a higher risk of blood clots, when you turn 35, uh, obviously the risk is higher with people who smoke and I do not smoke. Still, I wanted to eliminate that risk. So I switched to a copper IUD, which we can talk about. I don't think that I had an abnormal reaction to the placement of that because from other women that I've spoken to, the placement of an IUD is actually worse than giving birth for a lot of people. There are very little providers who will actually offer anything for pain management in preparation for it. There is a medication that you can get that will actually soften your cervix so that it's not as tightly held together as it normally would be. They just, they don't offer it. And it really speaks to the medical system and the misogyny that you find in a lot of physicians, especially male ones, in that women don't need to have pain management. But if we flipped it and this was a male patient having a similar procedure, they would be throwing them narcotics. Yeah, it is it is ridiculous. And I only know undergoing IUD procedures prior to my endometriosis excision. It was horrendous. And the doctors tell you, oh, yeah, you'll feel a lot of pressure. It's not painful. I really don't know if it was the pain due to the fact that I had fibrotic endo and like scar tissue all through there that was undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. The three times I had an IUD placed. I think the majority of people I know that have had IUD placements all just say the same thing. The last two IUDs I've had, I've just had them during surgery. Yeah. What was the reasoning for the copper IUD versus something like a Mirena IUD? Because they knew you had an endometrioma, though it wasn't fully explained that that is endometriosis. I know you weren't having painful or heavy periods, but why the copper IUD? So the copper IUD was actually placed when I was 35 and we didn't Got start it. trying to get, or maybe 36, start trying to get pregnant until I was 40. That was when the endometrioma was discovered. Uh, the reason that I chose the copper IUD ultimately was because I didn't want the hormones mm. um, because we thought that that might be contributing to what was happening with my skin. Yeah, it makes more sense now that it was before the awareness of the endometrioma. 
Yes. When you first went on birth control, what was the initial purpose? Was it contraceptive or was it to control? It was contraceptive. Okay. So then you went through, you were wanting to start a family. So you addressed the IUD, you underwent some imaging. And I was told based on my lab work that my, uh, you know, I was experiencing what a lot of women um, who early 40s, some of them in their late 30s experience, which is a decrease in egg quality and egg count that they can see based on lab work. Okay. Uh, that didn't mean that it would be impossible, but no one ever told me that, hey, this endometrioma means that you have endometriosis. It was interesting because I had two very close friends who both had severe endometriosis. One had severe pain, but she had stage two endo. Um, and the other one had both severe pain, heavy periods, like classic endo symptoms, but she'd known about it for years. I didn't make the connection for myself, despite having two women that I care about immensely and one who I watched actively go through round after round of infertility. She and her husband were had tried to adopt because that was ultimately part of how they had wanted from the very beginning of their relationship to have a larger family, mm -hmm. go through multiple rounds of failed adoptions. Finally, she had had some success with an egg retrieval and she had a, a baby that a friend of hers was uh, carrying that was at an implantation surrogacy situation. Despite having those two people in my life, I didn't make the connection that endometrioma equals endometriosis is mm -hmm. equal to, I could potentially be facing something similar to what my friend had faced. But that's exactly what happened. What fascinates me is those that have symptoms more related to, well, I should say those that don't have the classic symptoms per se, pain, heavy periods, but that one I really see, a lot of people have heavy periods, but many, many people do not have heavy periods with endo. When there's no none of those signs or symptoms from a young age, I'm always concerned about the infertility piece, and that might be the main one, or immune dysfunction, which you clearly had as well. Mm -hmm. though you had a number of other situations to to probably influence that. It's the infertility. And depending on when you start that journey, you know, at 40, that's a lot harder to try to deal with and rush through if you now have to deal with endometriosis as when endo has probably been going on that whole time in its own ways. You just didn't have those symptoms like your friends you were sharing had to alert you, hey, I need to find somebody that can help me with this. One of the steps in that journey, because I knew that my friend had had infertility issues and she loved her doctor. And I reached out and said, hey, we're looking at a fertility specialist. Can you tell, remind me which one was yours and would you recommend? And she said, absolutely. Gave me his information. I called their office, got set up with them. And unfortunately, the doctor that um, she had recommended wasn't available. So they set me up with one of their newer physicians to the practice. And I saw him. He asked us if we had tried on our own. And and we said, no, we haven't. And there's some challenges because of my work schedule. I'm gone generally Monday through Thursday. And he said, you know, just try for six months. Usually with people that are younger, we say try for a year and then come to fertility. And he had my medical records. He could see the endometrioma on there. Nothing was mentioned about that. I'm assuming it was a reproductive endocrinologist, but is this somebody who knows endo or is supposed to know about endometriosis? Um, this was the actually fertility specialist at the fertility okay. clinic. He could see the fibroid, he could see the, en the uh, endometrioma, but nothing was mentioned about it. So I just let it go. I didn't think anything of it. And he confirmed with the fibroid, which is actually more of what I was concerned about was, you know, the fibroids in a location that shouldn't affect your ability to carry a pregnancy to term successfully. There were a number of other things that occurred sort of during that time frame that I'm not really prepared to talk about. We ended up trying on our own. We did, I think we went a, bit, a little bit longer than six months just because we kind of really wanted to make sure that we gave it a, a good try. And, you know, because I was traveling so often, felt like okay, maybe we weren't like timing it properly, but I was doing all the like taking my temperature every morning, doing all those things to try and find where I am in my cycle so that I can know we can know when we should be having intercourse so that we can successfully have a pregnancy. That didn't work. We went back to fertility. They said, okay, let's try IUI. I think we went through 
three rounds of IUI, which was just, in my opinion, a waste of money, resources, and time. Very rarely is it successful. And then we moved to IVF. We got to the very first round of IVF and we got to the point in the cycle where I was supposed to be going in for egg retrieval. They were monitoring when we could go in for egg retrieval. So I was there, I think every other day and I had to alter my work schedule. There was a lot of things that were happening that I had to manage all while still working. At that point, I think I was working about 60 hours a week, which was on the lighter side for me. Unfortunately, we were not able to move forward with the egg retrieval because my eggs would not grow past 15 centimeters. The only ovary that was producing any eggs was my right. I had asked, now I'm remembering, I had asked about the endometrioma on my left ovary. I had been told that they could go in surgically and remove the endometrioma. However, that might affect the number of eggs that could be retrieved, et cetera. So it was better just to leave it because we wanted to preserve as much natural fertility as I already had. And since all of my lab work showed that that was already starting to decline, they really didn't want to do it. I hear this all the time from patients that are told this from fertility specialists that aren't really knowledgeable about endo. In talking with Paul Tyan, he specifically addressed that in in our episode where he said, if you do it the right way, you can really save that fertility. Now, I will say skipping ahead and knowing what was found, that's probably not the case for you, but they didn't know that without seeing it. But in yeah. general, I think that's such BS. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. What I know now, I wish I knew then so that I could advocate for myself. But I'm also a very different person today than I was four years ago, even four and a half years ago. And I think based on what's going on with me today, it may be a little bit of a blessing that I did face the infertility. I am also a believer that not that bad things should happen to people because it makes for a positive experience, nothing like that. But I do find that things happen for reasons and we don't always see those. It's a sliding door. You can't really, what if this, then that, because the trajectory may be completely different and we just never really know. Post IVF trials, next chapter. The same thing happened on the next round of IVF. At that point, I had actually, I had asked to switch to one of their, one of the other providers in the, in the fertility group, because I just Mm -hmm. didn't jive personality wise with our original one. The one that I switched to was a younger female, very empathetic. I remember when she told me when we were doing the very last egg check to see if we could do a retrieval. And she sat down and she looked at me and she said, I think that your endometriosis is much more severe than what we can see on imaging. That I really, I think that you need to see an endometriosis specialist. And I don't think that you will be able to even get to the point where we can retrieve eggs or even carry a pregnancy successfully to term. My reaction, I I know, surprised her because I didn't have a reaction. I was in the office by myself. I think it was a Sunday morning or maybe a holiday morning because the parking lot, I would just recall being empty. For some reason, I told my husband that I could go by myself because I've been to many, many doctor's appointments throughout the years by myself without any sort of issue. So I managed to hold it together until I got to my car. Once I got into my car, I just, I couldn't control the, I'm going to start crying now too. I could not control the just entire body sobbing. And it continued for, I don't even know how long. I have two quite close friends from work who were there with me throughout the whole journey and all the stuff that was leading up to uh, the fertility portion where we needed the assistance of fertility. And I remember even, I think I texted them before I texted Ron because I wanted to talk to him in person. It was immediate. What do you need? What can we do? We love you. We're so sorry. And the same thing with, with my family, specifically my cousin, who is like my sister, but 10 years younger, (laughs) immediately. And she has had uh, three kids, haven't had any issues. And she said, we're done having kids. Do you want one of my eggs? 
do you want me to carry a surrogacy for you? It could be my egg and Ron's sperm. And I, I asked Ron, we talked about it at length, and we decided that unless we could have a child that was my egg and his sperm, we, we were okay. Wow. What an amazing friend. I can't even comprehend how you could have felt after the series of life events, not just the few years of that particular prep for pregnancy, and sort of to have that as is the end result, I, I can't even imagine. It almost feels like it happened to a different person. And I was a, a different person then. I'm, I don't feel the same internally in my heart or in my body that I did then. And I also have a lot more understanding of myself and the way that I reacted and why I reacted that way. You know, this sh sort of storm that came a little bit after that. It took a while, but I had a, a severe reaction and I just threw myself into work and then work got too stressful. And I was having active panic attacks during meetings, partially because I didn't feel well and I was trying to push myself to get through work because that was the only thing that I felt like I had at that point. Yeah. You know, I had my family and I had my stepdaughter. So I call my daughter most of the time because it's just easier. And she is my daughter in my heart. Mm -hmm. But when I started to lose my ability to be functional at work, it really affected me mentally. And it also affected my, my ability to tolerate the pain that I was in. And I think at that mm -hmm. time, the pain also started escalating to be significantly worse. And yeah. we understand why. All of the fertility drugs that are used really shouldn't be given to someone with endometriosis. Yeah. At least informed consent, meaning for people listening, it should be your choice with the understanding behind this that with essentially undiagnosed, yours was diagnosed to some degree, without managed endometriosis, it can really wreak havoc on your body. Some may still choose that because it's a priority and that is absolutely okay. It's a valid choice. The issue is when you don't have the full understanding of why you're having fertility issues to begin with and need to use these drugs and then experience the aftermath, it's very confusing, let alone you feel awful. And I don't understand why more fertility specialists, like reproductive endocrinologists, do not just refer out for management of endometriosis before starting this. I, I still am baffled by it. Yeah, I, I don't either. And I feel very strongly that although the intention behind, I think a lot of my physicians care of me has been to do their due diligence and do, you know, meet their duty of care. But I also do feel like there was a failure. Yes. When you were in the car after following this non-reaction in the doctor's appointment, you're alone. You had this release. Can you explain more where your mind was at that point? Did it come from a place of this isn't fair? I don't want this result. Is it the grieving sort of a loss of a new chapter? Can you dive into that? Well, I loved my car. It was a little gift to myself when before I a year before I started dating my husband, but because I thought I was going to be single forever. <laughs> It was not a practical choice, especially not for a family. We have luckily another vehicle that is a practical choice. I was conf I was really confused and I didn't understand why my body was failing me. I felt like I had made the vastly wrong choice to wait until I was at that point 41 to start aggressively doing fertility treatments. I was especially angry at my husband. Uh, a lot of my anger was directed at him. Even though we made that choice together as a, as a couple, I know that for him, there was an additional reason behind wanting to wait a couple of years after we were married before getting pregnant. It's a, a valid reason. It was his to make and, and I agreed. I thought, let's enjoy being married for a couple of years and people get pregnant at 40 or older all the time. And I'm 38. So what's two years or a year and a half really going to do. After I got that new fertility news, diagnosis, whatever you want to call it, I had a lot of anger towards him for a really long time. 
which I had to actively work on releasing the help of my amazing therapist. It's even been a while. So talking about this is a sort of reminding me of some of the things that I went through then because I've pushed a lot of it to the back of my of my mind. It doesn't trigger me like it did before. I still have a lot of empathy, which is what I was looking for, for myself and for my husband and for what he's been through too, because I think a lot of people don't talk about what happens to our partners when we're dealing with an infertility diagnosis like this too. And especially if you're in a male-female relationship, a lot of what the men go through is not discussed or just dismissed entirely. And that's really not fair. Yeah. Did he see a therapist at all during this time? Or did you both have discussions around what was going on? Or was there too much emotion and maybe resentment or whatever word you want to put in there to really discuss in a productive way? I've been in individual therapy for years. My personal opinion is that everyone should be in therapy, even if you don't have a specific issue that you're working on, and maybe you don't do it consistently like I do, or you go back when something crops up, but it's a really useful tool to have in your toolbox. But no, he did not go to individual therapy at that time. He's really good at working stuff out on his own, although I have pushed him a few times to do that uh, when various things come up, and he has. But a lot of it was me working on releasing my anger towards that because a lot of it was also anger at myself for making what I saw as the wrong choice. You can't change what's already passed. So the anger doesn't really do anything but create a negative dynamic between you and your partner and towards yourself as well, because I was 100% a part of that choice. Yeah, We have to go through the, the stages, right? I don't know. I can't recall all of them, but like denial, anger, you know, grief. Oh, the, yeah, so. the grieving stages. Yeah. Yeah. I think many people can understand where you're coming from, but going through it is so different. Yeah. And I recalled those stages from when I was mourning my father's loss. It was similar, but it was something theoretical too. I had to remind myself that even if I had started younger, there was no guarantee that it would be easy or even possible. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to share regarding that chapter of that journey, you and Ron's relationship and the grieving process of having that news? I think the biggest thing that I want to share, and this is me sitting in this chair now with the opportunity to look back on what happened not that long ago in all perspective, you know, two years ago, Mm -hmm. two and a half years ago, whatever I was feeling and whatever anyone else is feeling is completely valid. Even if there are people around you that are not able to validate what you're going through, if you can find a way to give yourself the validation that you need and understand that this is something that you're going through and this is your reaction and not, not try and judge it. That's like one of the most valuable things that you can do, not just in what you're going through now, but in anything that you might encounter. Great point. It's been incredible to hear your reflections on not just the last few years, but the several decades of experiences. It's very clear that you've process a lot of this and come out with some understanding and seeing some of the positives in these different situations, though these are all terrible and hard and frustrating and emotional and have created a lot of probably changes in your life trajectory of where you thought you may be. You've clearly come out with such a different perspective. Yeah, it's been not an easy road to get here. It's definitely been one where I've learned to, I've always been able to give other people empathy, had a really hard time having, having it for myself. It's been an interesting journey to be able to apply that to where I am. Do you want to share a little bit about what you shared with me? I thought that was really important. I think many people can relate to what you had told me. How I talked about that I have a black hole for my own stuff. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I watched myself actively stick my head in the sand for certain diagnoses um, over the years. And especially with the endometrium, I spent a lot of time beating myself up. I should have known that that meant that I had endometriosis, especially with watching my two friends go through what they did. You know, I have a number of other friends who have gone through 
with endometriosis, they may, they may not be as vocal about it and I might not be as close to them. I can name I, at least a dozen women that have had endo touch their lives in some way. For myself, it, it seemed like I really should have, and I say should, um, which my dear therapist always reminds me uh, that I shouldn't, I should not should all over myself. Yes. I really feel like I failed myself when I did not get my curious researcher brain involved or it didn't automatically turn on and say, hey, what is an endometrioma? Let's look and see what that is. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I just accepted what the physicians told me and moved on. It's also interesting because I have an ability to see things that are happening with other people in my life wonder about various conditions that I'm aware of or that I've come across in my research or my reading. I think they're having this, but I'm not sure. And obviously I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not qualified to make a diagnosis. That person being like, Hey, guess what? That person you sent me, sent me to was really amazing. And also they said that I have this and it's the exact same thing that my, that I thought of like, Oh my gosh. I just, there's a disconnect between what I'm able to see in others versus what I'm able to see in myself. And I think that might be a similar experience to a lot of people who have chronic illness or um, who have gone through what I've gone through, basically a lifetime of medical gaslighting, even if it's not intended as a negative, because gaslighting has this sort of component of intentional subterfuge. Yes which I don't think that that always is the case. I mean, sure, there might have been like one or two in my life that were like, go away, little girl. For the most part, I feel when you get into the medical field, your intentions are well-meaning. The medical profession as a whole can be better about how that is portrayed and the process of that, uh, because I think that's where it becomes more of this gaslighting and it feels very personal or intentional. The majority of the times it's not, but for a number of reasons, the result is that. Yeah. Is there anything else you would want to share with anybody before we wrap up? Thank you for listening to my story. And thank you for letting me be on the podcast. Absolutely. And we have so much more to talk about. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing this part of your journey. But there's so much more to discuss with your journey, including us starting to work together, what, over the last year or so, probably Mm -hmm. now, into surgery, what your diagnosis was, but a lot of other fun things that I I would love for you to share about who you are now. Several instances during the interview today, you really have shown that there's been a huge amount of growth that's come out of this. This is a new person and a new life in a new situation. Even coming from surgery back in December, I I think we started seeing each other again in January, February. Seeing where you've come even since then has been a huge personal growth for you. So I wanted to share that. I appreciate it. I feel today much more like the person that I remember being because there were years where I was afraid to do anything. Didn't want to do anything and couldn't do anything because I felt so terrible in my body, slowly, slowly inching towards what feels more normal. Well, on that note, Christina and I are about to go jump in the water and do some surfing. More on that in part two. I'm not surfing. (laughs) Okay. Ocean, boogie boarding. I'm going to float. Just going to have fun in the ocean. More on that in part two of Christina's story more soon, but we're off to go surfing. So thank you for everybody listening and tuning in. We will share part two of Christina's journey in the next episode. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. 
Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis.